listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. All right, uh, I'm here today to speak with Tom Zollner, who is the author of several books, including Uranium, Train, and The Heartless Stone. He's also the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, An Ordinary Man. Today, I want to talk to him about a brand new book that is out called Island on Fire, The Revolt That Ended Slavery in the British Empire. It is a thrilling account of a little-known slave rebellion on Jamaica, which had played a huge role in British emancipation. Hi, Tom. Uh, glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, um, before we get into, uh, I guess, the meaty and potatoes of your book, I want to set the scene. Um, the British conquered Jamaica in the 1650s, and they start building uh, their colony based on on slave labor and, and uh, sugar plantations, essentially. Um, I thought... The picture you painted of Jamaica was pretty surprising. Um, it just seemed like a thoroughly corrupt and dehumanizing society. Um, and in fact, you mentioned that one writer in the late 17th century called Jamaica the Sodom of the Indies. Um, and this would just, I guess, have been a pretty common conception at the time. Uh, but anyway, can you give us a sense of what pre-emancipation pre -emancipation Jamaica would have been like? Yeah, you, you could picture frontier colonies in the, U, in the United States, in the western United States, the sort of uh, free-for-all that uh, they were sometimes depicted to be. And that was accurate when it came to Jamaica. This was uh, the place that you went if you were what was called the second son um, or someone who didn't have many prospects back in the British Isles, you went to Jamaica and you tried to get rich as fast as you could. And it was, uh, as you note, a cruel and uh, corrupt society. Yeah. The, the, the way that you made money was through growing sugar, and the way that you grew sugar was by using slaves. So the island had a population of approximately a 10 to 1 ratio, uh, 10 enslaved people for... Uh, for every uh, person from uh, the British Isles, almost invariably men, young men, um, it was uh, deadly to them when it came to tropical diseases, yellow fever and so forth. Um, it was a, uh, a, a, a violent place and uh, one of astonishing cruelty. Um, the cruelty of slavery, of course, could not be overstated. Yeah, I know. Um, you, you definitely... I, that, that that's for sure. Uh, in fact, I, I don't even think I want to mention it on on air and this and this exactly what it is. But uh, you taught me about something called Derby's Dose, which was a specific torture that uh, I just want for the people that are listening here. And I, I the show is marked explicit, Tom, but uh, 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 that was a, a torture that was invented. You can look up. It made me gag if you want to know about it. Uh, but, so to speak, yeah, it was, right. we don't know how widespread it was, but a man uh, named Thomas Thistlewood, who kept a, a precise diary, uh, yeah. not, not not just of, uh, you know, what he had for dinner, but also the slave, the female slaves that he would uh, essentially rape uh, that day, and uh, as well as uh, what he did to punish uh, enslaved people that he felt had, uh, were deserving of punishment, and one poor guy named Derby, we learn, uh, was made to put uh, excrement in his mouth and then uh, had his mouth wired shut for several several hours. So he was uh, forced to taste it and swallow it. Yeah, that's that's pretty horrifying. And but what? And I think what re I mean that was very shocking to me to to learn that. And um, and just on a personal note, I, I read a book called The Reaper's Garden. I didn't know I could be shocked by Jamaican history anymore. Um, but I, I guess uh, you also make a point that um, that Mr. Thistlewood wasn't, I mean, he uh, probably a bit extreme, but wasn't that far off from what would happen to a lot of these guys. Because you say they come to Jamaica, essentially, I guess that means the job was you would get a whip put in your hand. This got noted in uh, many, many diaries. Um, it's an extremely troubling view into um, sociology. 
But uh, Jamaica being the, uh, the the cruel place that it was, you know, guys who from the from Britain who got off the ship, you know, were, no, were initially quite horrified at what they saw. The routine whippings, the, you know, uh, cheapness of life, all of that. And they and, and with in their first letters, they would you know note this. But then a, a, a really disturbing transformation took place where within several weeks they had become accustomed to it. And had begun to adopt the uh, the worldview of the slaveholders, and uh, were almost inevitably doing the whipping themselves within several weeks. So, you know, this is a window into how ordinarily decent people, through the power of context, can find themselves doing absolutely horrific things. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I, I, the, the, the the Milgram experiments at Yale, the infamous sort of torture experiments there, or the uh, Zimbardo prison in Stanford, you know, this was happening in Jamaica uh, in 18th countries. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you. I think it, it, reading the book and getting into some of those, uh, some of the quotes you have from some of the diaries was really, I, I really just enjoyed that, I want to say. Um, now, and I, with that said, I, there's another part um uh, in another uh, chapter, I guess, of the book, you talk about something that people might not think about when they think about why a sugar plantation was. I don't want to put the British off the hook, but you make a pretty good case that the British were completely addicted to sugar, I think. Is that accurate? Yep. Certainly um, not just by uh, qualitative accounts, but by the raw statistics in terms of sugar consumption when compared to other European nations, the British were consuming it at an exponential rate. And, you know, what fueled it was the, uh, the tropical growing conditions in the Caribbean and the way that it could be done uh, on a you know, commodity scale with the help of slavery. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, and I, 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 I thought that was, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, now, uh, I, there's a lot of money to be made um, in the sugar business. You make make it, uh, it during the 17th and much of the 18th century, and uh, you the sugar planters use that wealth to buy a greater voice in government than than I guess they they ought to have in Parliament. Uh, how does that? Um, just I, I know I've got plenty of people in my audience who probably completely understand how this works, but. Uh, uh, I think I, I've also got some younger folks in the audience too, and and just can you briefly go over why, um, how Parliament could be uh, kind of taken over uh, almost? Sure. Not, not exactly. Uh, they, you say they don't have like a full control of Parliament, obviously, but uh, they bought like fifty seats. Yes. So uh, we in the United States hear a lot about um, the influence of money on politics and. Uh, of late, uh, the dark money that uh, billionaires okay. use to advance a stealth agenda and keep uh, our legislative body locked up. This is nothing new. Slavery was pro prolonged for decades because of the influence of British dark money. And the, the way that worked was uh, the seats in Parliament were still apportioned based on uh, medieval um, geographic boundaries. And so you had what were called rotten boroughs, these uh, areas of, 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 of Britain, of the homeland, that uh, where no one lived anymore. There were cases of uh, seats in parliament given to deserted areas of the countryside where the population had, had moved on. And so it was therefore easy for the quote unquote billionaires of the day in Britain, you know, many of them with heavy investments in West Indian sugar and slavery to buy these seats, to, 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 to bribe the very few people living in these rotten boroughs, as they were called, uh, to, to put their guy uh, in, into parliament and stave off any attempt to um, damage uh, sugar interests, which were co-joined with slavery interests. So this began to, to crack in uh, beginning uh, legislatively in 1807. Abolitionists had made humanitarian arguments to end what was called the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and 
it more or less did, in fact, with some exceptions, prevent the further kidnapping of Africans to be trucked over to the Caribbean to go work on the sugar estates. Um, it did not achieve full abolition. So there was a period of three decades, roughly three decades, where you know the preservation of slavery in the West Indies became um, the primary political interest of what was called the West Indian interest. Mm. And I, 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 I'm asking that kind of curiosity. Um, there's, I see a relation between that and what happens in the United States. Obviously, the United States, I think the Constitution does that, or I know the founders kind of limit the slave trade. And I wonder if there's a, is there a similar thing just kind of maybe um, where it seems like some of the larger uh, – Slave owners, like people like Thomas Jefferson, by banning the slave trade, kind of gave themselves a monopoly on the slave trade because it was just an international ban. Is there is there anything to that? Do you think I, I, that's just an idea I've kind of been toying around with in my head? I don't. What the effect of the of, of the slave trade ban, which did, as you know, it become eventually international was it forced um, plantation owners in, in the British West Indies to sort of rethink this idea of, uh, and this is a harsh reality, that we're, they're just going to work, work their laborers until they died. Yeah. Uh, there was no interest in what, uh, what the demographers called natural increase. You know, that is to say, um, slave families having children. Uh, that, was, that was regarded as, why would you do that? You know, it puts the, it puts the mother out of commission you know, for, uh, for several months. And then, you know, there's this little baby that, you know, really isn't ready to go work in the fields for a couple of years. And so this, uh, this is not a good return on investment, you know, just, uh, let them die without having children. Um, that enormously cruel facet of the, of the slave trade had to be rethought after the 1807 ban. And there was more attention paid towards, you know, let's, let's try and keep, um, children alive so that they can, you know, become good workers and become work to the bone. Mm. Progress does come slowly, I guess, sometimes, that's for sure. Um, okay. Now, now there's also, obviously, as we get close, the, you know, the rebellion happens in uh, in 1831, I, I think. In, and uh, as we get on into that, there's a lot of changes taking place in England and uh, in, in Britain because of industrialization. And... Um, you made, uh, I, I guess, some interesting points that I, I certainly you don't think of, I didn't think about a lot with industrialization. But what that meant for some of those same second sons who a hundred years before maybe their grandfathers, um, and, and I noticed a lot of these are the same families in in Jamaica, you know, over time. Uh, but at any rate, um, what does this mean for Jamaica? Uh, these changes back in England, where maybe a hundred years ago you'd have somebody coming to Jamaica um, and getting a whip put in their hand, but it, it seems like there's other opportunities, I guess. Uh, in terms I, of sugar growing? Or, or, excuse not as in terms of sugar growing. I, I guess there, it seems like there's um, the, the I, I guess there's a lot of missionaries coming over. Oh, um, yes. And yes. Previously, um, the what were called the dissenting sects in uh, England, that is to say Methodists and Baptists, we're not focused on saving the souls of enslaved people. Um, their 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 mission was more uh, at home. And John Wesley, the 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 famous um, what amounts to the founder of the Methodist Church, who never actually did leave the Church of England, but he rode a quarter million miles by some calculations, preaching to uh, what we now call the white working class wherever they could be found. You know, he preached inside coal mines under under trees, wherever he could find an audience. Um, and he himself had lived in the slave colony, that is uh, Savannah, Georgia. Yes. In, yeah, in the early 1700s. And it had always bothered him what he saw. Um, and near the kind of the end of his preaching career, he began to sort of think about uh, the universal human soul and of, uh, of bringing Christian light uh, two, uh, two enslaved people who, you know, were completely, almost completely ignored by the Church of England. So there was a, a missionary energy directed towards Jamaica. And this would eventually be a huge part of what ended slavery. 
um, because as the slaveholding society in fits and starts and often quite reluctantly began to admit these white missionaries onto the island to teach Bible lessons um, and teach the power of literacy. Mm. The, 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 the Protestant road to salvation leads through scripture and you know they, they believed, the missionaries did, um, we've got to teach our new converts how to read so that they can read the New Testament and see the gospel for themselves. Uh, many of these white missionaries hated slavery, but they had to be quiet about it. They could not go around in Jamaica uttering a word against the prevailing social condition or they were going to find themselves on a fast trip home. Right. And but some of them are able, I guess, yet to start up congregations of enslaved peoples. And I guess and that is where um, an enslaved man named Samuel Sharp kind of comes into the story. Yes. Um, uh, who I mean, t- who is Reverend Samuel Sharp? He's actually Deacon Samuel Sharp. He, Deacon Samuel Sharp. Excuse me. Yeah, he was not uh, ordained uh, in in any church, but he was given a subsidiary role as a uh, as a deacon and permitted to move between sugar estates to teach Bible lessons. And he himself was literate and uh, began to formulate a kind of uh, a liberation theology uh, based on a Protestant reading of the New Testament, um, particularly some of the verses that were considered too hot to handle. That is to say that were avoided, necessarily avoided by the white missionaries um, there is neither uh, Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor man or woman in Christ Jesus, as St. Paul taught. Um, uh, no man can serve two masters was another kind of underground verse preached by Samuel Sharp. And he began to fuse these biblical ideas with what he was reading from the newspapers that were tossed off the ships at the harbor in Montego Bay. That is to say, news about the abolitionist movement back in Britain. You know, you weren't going to find yeah. that stuff really within Jamaican newspapers, but British newspapers um, were, were a bit more freewheeling. And Samuel Sharp began to preach this idea that uh, not only does the Bible say that sla- slavery is against God's law, but actually, and this is where he began to get a little creative, he began to tell uh elite enslaved people that the king of England is on our side and that freedom is coming and that the white slaveholders of Jamaica have censored this news. Now this was a, this was a conspiracy theory and all conspiracy theories have a little grain of truth, you know, and it was true that the, 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 the owners of the sugar estates in Jamaica were not exactly eager to talk about the abolitionist debate but the King of England was by no means on the side of the enslaved people. Samuel Sharp was frankly just making that up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th- I thought that was fascinating. I mean, sometimes it's so easy to when you're thinking about slavery uh, that to, to forget the agency that that sometimes slave enslaved people are capable of. And uh, uh, I, th- I think that's a, that's a really neat tactic. Um, well, anyway, but he, so he is. Um, he obviously he can't talk to a whole lot of people, though. Um, so how does I guess how does um, he he starts uh, recruiting people and how did so how does he get his message out? His tactics um, anticipated that of Gandhi seventy years later, and uh, that of uh, Martin Luther King nearly a uh, hundred years later. Um, he also borrowed. Uh, covert uh, organizing strategies, or rather he sort of invented them in, in this tropical backwater. And, you know, groups like the uh, the West German underground, the French resistance would later uh, adopt some of these resistance tactics, which, you know, are kind of timeless. Wow. So he, he would go for Samuel Sharp when recruiting conspirators, he would, he would go for uh, the most trusted men. They were all, almost always men on the sugar estates, the head boiler, head sugar boiler, the head driver, people in a position of trust who would then be sworn in uh, in this, you know, kind of secret underground source of knowledge. They called it the business. And, you know, Samuel Sharp would swear the men on the Bible that um, two days after Christmas, December 27th, 1831, that there would be this organized attempt to just sit down and refuse to work. 
So he set out to do something nonviolent, mm. shocking, you know, and certainly um, worthy of a hanging in the, uh, you know, the system of quote unquote justice of the day. But Samuel Sharp did not, you know, want to create this mass burning, certainly not murder, uh, as had been done uh, over in Haiti. Um, or in South Abdon County, Virginia, uh, in the same year, 1831, by Nat Turner. Uh, his, his goal was peaceful, peaceful non nonviolence, and uh, this is this is uh, what, in fact, happened uh, on December 27th, and lasting five weeks therein, in a spotty fashion. Others took his message uh, to be one more of uh, active resistance, and they started setting fires to what was called the trash houses. Uh, where the, the, the stored up husks of sugar cane, which went up in flames. And what you, what you saw there for five weeks in 1831, 1832, was uh, an island almost entirely on fire in the northwest corner. Wow, yeah. And um, now, you make it clear. I love in the book how there's... Um, this is obviously seems like a very confusing time, and I, I don't want to get. I, I think it's better for people to read the book to actually un, completely understand how the rebellion works and everything. There's some great maps and and everything that that really kind of uh, help you place, you know, troops and everything. But I, I, Tom, the, uh, this seems like this is one of those places in, in human history where the shit hits the fan and for both good and bad, you get some of the sort of anecdotes that really shine a light on what people are capable of. Um, do you want to share maybe just during this chaotic time, uh, just one or two instances uh, uh uh, of the sort of, of the, I guess the sort of events that are going on, uh, because it's, it seems like it's really, it, it's it's pretty complicated to me. I, I think that it, it, at one, uh, the, you mentioned there's one slave owner who has twenty, who you know he immediately when the fire hit gives twenty of his uh, rifles to to his to his most trusted slave. So. There's no one way. There's no one way this happens. There was no one way that the rebellion played itself out. Um, the Samuel Sharp's uh, conspiracy to, to, to sit down and not work was um, in, embraced in a spotty fashion across the northwestern section of the island. Um, you know, so, some slaves uh, did, in fact, uh, uh, sit down peacefully and refuse to work. Many did. Uh, others wanted nothing to do with it. Um, and, you know, actively uh, fought with their masters against the rebellion. Uh, and as previously mentioned, uh, others took it as an opportunity to destroy the means of production, um, yeah, slavery, and, and and burn down the sugar works. Yeah, that was another interesting thing. It, it seemed um, that uh, Sam Sharp seemed to be like kind of the guy who came up with this plan, but there was an alternate plan that at least some other people had. I, it seemed like where in, it seems that Sam Sharp, his plan was to. Uh, I, I guess uh, uh, force all the white people to just sit there in, uh, and until they agreed to pay them. Right. Um, and, and, and but Sam Sharp other... wanted, to, wanted what every worker wants, which is fair right. pay for. Absolutely. Uh, and then there's other guy. I just think this is inter just a difference in strategy where he says, well, you know, I think what we should do, I guess, is burn down all the sugar works so that they can't make us back, go back to work. Sure. Um, I mean, historians still argue about this to this day. You know, who was Sam Sharp? Was he a man right. of peace or a man of war? And, you know, uh, the uh, University of the West Indies historian Vereen Shepard calls it a plan B. That, you know, mm. there's, there's conflicting evidence that emerged from parliamentary and Jamaica Assembly inquiries into what exactly happened. And uh, there's, there's evidence to support both points of view. Um, but where Professor Shepard and I, I think, are in alignment is, is we agree that there was a rough plan that should the sitting down be met with violence on the part of the white militia, which, you know, certainly that was a, a logical inference, that the slaves were going to defend themselves, that they, they would fight back. And, you know, that seems to have happened 
uh, at certain geographical points within this uh, fairly wide area, almost 70 miles in every direction. Yeah. Um, now, and and, and, and uh, kind of staying with it, there was a lot of slaves, uh, the hundreds, who, who paid for this rebellion with their life. Um, some of them probably weren't involved at all. Um, I, you, you said something, I, I, I don't want to quote you wrong exactly, but uh, something about how there were plenty of slaves who were executed because they were found in a sugar field with a machete, which is incidentally also where you would be if you were a slave who was not rebelling. Right. So you would go to the gallows, almost 500 dead, uh, to be in uh, just the wrong place at the wrong time. The, the, the evidence that would you know, get your execution warrant signed was painfully, painfully thin. Um, there are uh, multiple episodes of outright human hunting where these uh, militias, and I, let me just sort of parenthetically say that if you were a white man in between the ages of 16 or 60, you know, you were expected to, you know, be enlisted in what amounted to, you know, sort of a national guard and, you know, take on sort of military characteristics. And these uh, militias were often poorly trained, um, poorly disciplined, and, you know, not under control. You know, some of them just went out yeah. on this killing spree during the chaos of the rebellion. Right. And I I, I, I gather, part, I mean, part of that is just those are, yeah, part of that is uh, that the guy, a lot of these guys in the Jamaican militia, though, they're not necessarily the people who own the plantations and the slaves, is that true? So, I mean, yeah, that's, some yeah, of them that's are, and yeah. a lot of them are just work there. And well, a lot of I, them, you know, in fact, the majority were just simply um, these sort of underlings on the on the estates. You know, what was called the uh, bookkeepers, um, what, what was called uh, an attorney, which has nothing to do with the practice of law, but yeah, that essentially says that you're the deputy for the owner, who uh, most often was, you know, back in England and joined the. Uh, the, the the fabulous wealth that that he would get from these estates, and so yeah, you get these uh, guys who don't want to be there, um, who are often disgusted at what's going on, and you know, often hyped up into a state of paranoia, and so you, know, you see these uh, village massacres, you know, quite similar to what uh, American troops would do in Vietnam and Iraq. Yeah, um, and there's and uh, to uh, I guess to make this. Um even more shocking the way this operated too. There's another group on Jamaica who are also hunting down slaves during the rebellion. And after I get, you know, after the, I don't know if they're, they're hunting them down after the rebellion during the, the, the hangings afterwards, but they are the Maroons. Uh, who are the Maroons and what, why are they involved in this? What are their motives for all of this? These are communities of uh, escaped enslaved people who uh, found, founded their own society up in the mountainous territory. Um, they had uh, been there since the 1600s, and their numbers would occasionally grow because of uh, escaped slaves who would find their way to them. But more often than not, because of a treaty they had with the British, um, you know, they were bounty hunters. And they didn't have a whole lot of sympathy for uh, people who shared their skin color who were um, in bondage. Uh, they, you know, view, viewed their role as kind of like a parallel society, not yeah. necessarily in alliance with the uh, with the British, but certainly like living in a state of, of detente. And they didn't want to risk that by becoming, you know, this this kind of uh, welcoming refuge for the rebellious slaves. You know, Sam Sharp uh, tried to forge a kind of a a, a, a diplomatic alliance with them early in the rebellion, but it didn't end well. In fact, it ended with two of his emissaries being executed. And so the the, the, the Maroons were were not friends of the of the rebellious enslaved people. Yeah, I, I um, I, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that, that was that was quite something. I, and I, I and I get it was part of that. Or do they speak Spanish? The would have they would they were they speaking Spanish or the originally they were uh, Hispanophone slaves who had escaped from the 
uh, the island's original European quote unquote owners, the Spanish. Yeah. Uh, but but no, their 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 language gradually took on uh, characteristics of of the English language. And okay, so, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, I was kind of curious if he, if when he sent them out there, if if he was even confident. You know what I mean? If he even knew if they could communicate e easily. Um, yes, they were they were certainly able to uh, uh, to exchange um, you know ideas quite easily. The problem was that the uh, the ideas were divergent, right? Um, so, so there are. Uh, did more did more slaves die during the rebellion or afterwards? Uh, the date of the sort of ending of the rebellion has no fixed point. Okay, it, it was put down in a really messy fashion. Um, you know, throughout uh, the end of January and the beginning of. Of February, and there was really no one point where uh, anyone decreed it's over. Uh, right, but I know uh, they had to call in the the British Army. Yeah, uh, I guess, British uh, regular troops uh, came in, and you know they were more competent, uh, better disciplined, but even they were at times overwhelmed. And so, the 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 drumhead court martials uh, did continue um, even as the island uh, regained a, a, a state of. Uh, which, you know, what I suppose could be called tranquility, but really it was anything but, you know, the the, the, the horrific bad feelings uh, that uh, emerged from this, of course, carried back over to, uh, to, to, to Britain and would later land with a political explosion. Mm. And, um, I, okay, one thing I want to make, the, the sharp... Um, his rebellion, they have armed themselves off of the plantations they've rebelled against. Is that true? Yes. With, sometimes with uh, firearms, uh, more often with farm implements. Okay. Uh, and that, what, what, what I found, I think, most surprising is at the end, after all the dust has settled, um, you mentioned that Jamaican newspapers report that there were 14 dead whites in total during the rebellion, in contrast, I guess, to the hundreds, uh, maybe a thousand uh, dead slaves. Um, I thought that was, I mean, Sam Sharp obviously lost his life and a, a lot of people uh, did. But the contrast, I, I think, in the in the in the death toll was fascinating. I mean, the Jamaican newspapers are run. I, I mean, they have absolutely no. Uh, interest in, you know, in, 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 I guess, making the slaves cause, Sam Sharp's cause look good. Um, so would, does this mean that the rebellion was a success? It failed on the ground, but it succeeded uh, politically in a way that uh, almost no one connected with it could have uh, anticipated. You know, it got uh, extensive coverage in uh, British newspapers. Uh, it took a month approximately for the, for the ships to uh, the, the regular um, sort of parade of vessels hauling sugar and incidentally J Jamaican newspapers and, you know, uh, sort of face-to-face uh, -face news that, you know, by uh, the end of January, you know, the, the, the London papers were devoting an, uh, an extreme amount of coverage to this. And while some of it was exaggerated, um, much of it was uh, was in fact true that the costs of maintaining slavery economically, just from a cold-blooded perspective, uh, were going to be huge. And yeah. you know, this, this was also uh, after decades and decades of abolitionist arguments, uh, mainly from uh, dissenting sects of the church. And the Quakers really have to be singled out here for being, as far back as the 1600s, disgusted by slavery. And so, you know, th these arguments were not unfamiliar to uh, the British public that, you know, what's happening in, you know, the king's far dominions over in the, the West Indies was, was, was disgusting from a humanitarian point of view. And now you get this uh, really powerful economic argument as well that, you know, do we really want to keep paying for this? Right. Uh, yeah. Um... I don't know if I, 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 I don't know who said this, but there's a, a quote in the book or, or you paraphrase an argument that I found particularly powerful, which was uh, can can 
can English, can, can the British, I guess, be, can we be expected to engage in continual wars against our own enslaved citizens then? Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know if that's just me living, you know, in the United States in the 21st century with uh, everything that's that's gone on in, in my life and a little before with all the war we've been in. But uh, uh, that just seems like very, like a very, very powerful, powerful argument. Um, and I just want to mention. Um, so. So there are some big consequences for Sam Sharp's rebellion on the abolition debate in Britain. So, so the debate, uh, excuse me, the, the, the rebellion happens in 1831, and then abolition kind of happens very quickly afterwards on a political <laughs> timeline, I guess. Yeah, 18 months, which is lightning speed in terms of global events. And, you know, the central argue, argument of my book is that uh, this rebellion was the was the final uh, domino. You know, not the only one. There were there were moving parts, but that this happened several years ahead of time because of the actions of Sam Sharp. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I want to say it, it, I, I know more about uh, America. You know, just growing up, I've learned more about American history than than British history. But it really did it it. It reminded me of something I learned about during the Civil War, how uh, a professor once told me, yeah, well, the slaves kind of freed themselves in the Civil War. Uh, by the end of the war, 10 percent of the Union Army was African-American and they were highly motivated to fight. And this is a different kind of uh, a little bit different, but um, it, it, it's uh, very, very interesting. And I, I agree with you. I think uh, Sam Sharp has played a a pivotal role in abolition. Um, and uh, I, 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 I want to say I thank you for bringing him, his story, I guess, uh, to me and to everybody who's listening here. Um, I, I really appreciated that he was, you know, in that tradition of, uh, like, I, I guess, the kind of one of the founders of the intellectual tradition that would later bring us Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, I think that's really uh, incredible. He, he deserves a, a more uh, respected place in world history. He's uh, certainly known uh, in Jamaica, where his story is uh, is taught in public schools. Um, but in terms of uh, revolutionary impact, it's it's kind of shocking that uh, Samuel Sharp is not better known. I yeah, no, I agree with you there. I, I guess one I, one last uh, question that you do mention. Then um, could you explain a little bit? why that might be because you get a little bit into the relationship between jamaica and the united states at the time um it's not very good and so when news of his i guess except for the one the liberator newspaper in boston nobody's really talking about this is that right yeah um and and, and part of that uh, reason why even the american press the the american abolitionist press didn't um sort of emphasize uh individuals was because of the faceless way that uh, slavery had been uh, portrayed, you know, even among those who wanted to get rid of it. You know, it was almost as though uh, these individuals um, were, were viewed as a collective mass and not as, you know, they truly were, which is to say, you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, you know, individual men and women with uh, distinct uh, ambitions and personalities. Wow, yeah. All right. Well, um, Tom, it's been wonderful to speak with you today. I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. Um, everybody, the book is Island on Fire. The author is Tom Zollner. Uh, Tom, you are an awesome writer uh, for everybody listening. Uh, really, check this out. Uh, do you have any other, any upcoming books that you want to plug uh, that uh, we should keep an eye on? Uh, sure, nothing to do with the uh, uh, Atlantic history, rather a sure, series no, of yeah. essays about uh, the United States uh, called uh, The National Road uh, that uh, that comes out in um, October. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Thanks, man. Uh, thank you, Jim. All right. I'm going to stop recording. Hey, fellow pirates, come and listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command So let's drop him on an island 
And leave him in the sand Cause it's a mutiny It's a mutiny It's a mutiny And I'll take in all the ship It's a mutiny What's happening here? You're no longer in control And we're drinking up your beer This is now a democratic Eagerly tearing pirate ship So enjoy your trip Cause it's a mutiny It's a mutiny 